me here and also to those who are watching at home. Um, we're streaming this event live on Facebook, so hello to all those people at home. If you have questions that you want to ask me, um, either at the end or as we go through, um, if, you'd like, if you're watching from home, please just um, send through um, a comment on Facebook and Katie will ask those questions afterwards. Anybody in the room, of course, just ask as we go along. So thank you for coming along today. And I hope you find this little exploration of our 1850s dress interesting. If you've been living in Melbourne in the early to mid 1850s, the chances are that this is a dress you would have wanted to own. It's in a style that is known as the crinoline style from the wide skirts, which we can see here in front of us and on the screen here. And it was a must-have fashion of the decade, of the 1850s. Now, when we look at a dress like this, our first thought probably is, isn't it pretty? Isn't it romantic? It must have been lovely to glide around in a dress like this. For those of us who are old enough, we might have memories of Scarlett O'Hara descending down that wonderful staircase in Gone with the Wind and floating about in those frothy dresses. But was it really like that to wear a dress like this? That's one of the questions we're going to ask today. We'll look a little bit more closely at the dress itself, how it was made, how the shape we see was created. And then we'll think a little bit about what it was like to wear, to make, and to care for a dress like this one. And along the way, I think it raises some interesting questions about everyday life in Victoria and on the goldfields in the 1850s. And I should say by way of context that this is one of a number of objects which we'll be featuring in an exhibition which we're opening here in June, which is called Gold Rush, 20 Objects, 20 Stories. So this dress is one of those objects. Now just to start with some basics, this is a cotton day dress made to be worn in the warmer weather. And it's a one-piece dress, by which I mean that the skirt is attached to the, the uh, bodice at the waist here. Later, many dresses were made in two pieces, so separately, but not at this time. It's made of a printed cotton fabric that is probably best described as a sort of calico. It's quite a robust cotton, so not one of the very fine materials that were sometimes worn at this time. Uh, the muslins and cambrics. It's, it's a, a more robust fabric than this. And the bodice is lined with another calico fabric, but an even stronger weave. And you can see it on the screen there. It, this was a very common lining material at the time. We know that this dress is a day dress because of the shape of the bodice. It's cut high to the neck here, and the sleeves are full length, so long sleeves. It seems counterintuitive to us today, but ladies in the 1850s never showed their arms during the day. Unless, of course, they were working women. Washing women didn't have much choice. But a lady never showed her arms. At this time, except in the evening, and that does seem odd, doesn't it? But evening dresses were made quite differently. This is a very beautiful example, not one of ours, alas. And as you can see, they were often cut quite low across the bust here and with very short sleeves, which was fine during the summer, but in fact, most balls then um, were held during the winter. So it's not a very good prospect. It must have been pretty chilly, I think, on the gold fields. If you think about the temperatures we've had in Ballarat just in the last week or so, it must have been pretty chilly in those, in those uh, ballrooms. But we know that they wore dresses like this because here is a sketch that was done by uh, the colonial artist S.T. Gill of a subscription ball in Ballarat in 1853. And you can see from the ladies here that the dresses are really quite low cut uh, across the bodice and at the neckline and with very short sleeves. So even on Ballarat, in, on the goldfields, we know that women were sh following the general fashion of the time. But getting back to this dress, we know that it's a day dress, but the style of the dress is actually quite elaborate, as you can see, all these flounces on the skirt 
here, and there are two deep full flounces and one half flounce or peplum at the top there. For that reason, I wondered if perhaps this dress was what we might call an afternoon dress, to wear out when visiting perhaps, paying or receiving calls as it was often called in the 19th century, perhaps when shopping. Women who could afford to own several dresses, and we do need to qualify it by saying women who could afford to own several dresses because not all could. But those who could often seem to have changed their dresses during the day in accordance with what they were planning to do. So in the morning, perhaps their dress might be plainer, particularly if they had chores to do around the house. But if they were going out in the afternoon, they may well have worn something that was a bit more elaborate. So perhaps this was an afternoon dress, but it's not a very fine afternoon dress. The fabric is good quality, but not what I would call a fine fabric from the time. So I doubt that this dress was worn by a, a very wealthy woman, an elite woman, but nor is it likely to have been worn by a working woman, I suspect. I'm speculating that it was probably the kind of dress that a moderately prosperous middling class sort of woman might have worn. A doctor's wife perhaps, a successful shopkeeper or a tradesman's wife or daughter. A wealthy woman at this time probably wore silk in the afternoon. Here is a humorous sketch done by the artist John Leach in 1853. He titled it Alarming Prospect, The Single Ladies Off to the Diggings. And as you can see, um, if you can look carefully at that, the ladies in this drawing are wearing dresses which are very, very similar to this one. Now the main focus of these dresses, of course, is the wide bell-shaped skirt. This is the style that's known as the crinoline. The name came not from the dress itself, but from one of the petticoats which was often worn underneath it, that was often stiffened with horsehair. Later, and you may be familiar with this, the skirts were held out by a wire frame a sort of cage that was tied on around the waist and supported the width of the skirt. This crinoline frame was invented in 1856 and we speculate that it probably was in Australia shortly after this. But I think that this dress actually predates the crinoline frame itself. Now this skirt is very full. It measures, for those of you who are into statistics, 332 centimetres at the hem, so three and a third metres if you like, and that's just under four yards in the old measurements. And it was made by gathering and joining seven full lengths of dress fabric. The two deep flounces that you can, whoops, that you can see on the skirt here, here, were also made from seven separate dress lengths which are joined selvage to selvage and they're attached then to the base of the skirt and I'll show you how they did that in a minute. They add a lot of fullness to the skirt and a lot of weight, and they were a very popular fashion of the mid-1850s. Now, as you can see, a dress like this one used a great deal of dress material. We've estimated that there are probably about 13 metres of, of fabric used in the construction of this dress, or 14 yards in the old measurement. And that means two things. The first is that the dress itself is very heavy. We haven't actually weighed it, but it is noticeable weight. If you lift it, you're aware that, that you have a weight in your hands. The second, though, is that it was a large investment for its owner in both money and time, because dress fabric at this time was quite expensive relative to other things and certainly relative to the time of the dressmakers who were making up the dress, interestingly enough. But it also represented a huge investment in someone's time, either the woman who wore it and made it herself, or a professional dressmaker. We don't know who wore or who owned this dress, and we don't know who made it, but it is sewn entirely by hand. Sewing machines had been invented by the 1850s, but they were still only used in factories. They hadn't found their way into most dressmakers' studios, and they certainly hadn't found their way into the home. They became more common in the following decades, and if you look at dresses from the 1860s, you'll often see that 
there, there are sections of the dress that are sewn on machine and sections that are sewn by hand. And not surprisingly, the first use of these was often for sewing these long lengths of seams, and that's what those machines were best at. But the bodices and the more and the finer work was then done by hand still. But this dress, all of the stitching is done by hand, including all those yards of seams. The seams are stitched using a simple running stitch, but the bodice seams are all double stitched, if you can see that on the slide, and presumably that was for strength. Just at a very rough count, we counted the stitches in, in one length and then multiplied it by the, the length of the seams, and we worked out that there are more than 5,500 stitches in the skirt of this dress alone. So, that's a lot of time. Apart from the straightforward yards of seams, much of the other stitching in this dress is quite intricate and time consuming. The fullness of the skirts is made by folding over material at the top and then creating tiny tight gathers by pulling up gathering stitches to create tiny pleats. They were known at the time as organ pleats and if you look at that slide there you can see that they were then attached individually to the dress at the waist by hemming stitches. So each of these little pleats, each of them is attached by its own individual stitch at the waistband. The technique was once described to me by a member of the Embroiderers Guild of South Australia as hand stroking. And she explained that what a, seam, what a needlewoman did was to, to attach the seam at the top, the pleat at the top, and then run the needle down the length of the pleat to create the sharp edge, and it was known as hand stroking. It must have been very time consuming, and I think quite um, difficult to hold the fabric tightly enough to keep the tension. There's a separate um, other piece of cloth which we can't show you, which is underneath and is treated in exactly the same way, um, just a very short length, we're just at the waistband, and we're assuming that that was to just push the skirt out a little bit further from the waistband. The waistline itself is then edged with very narrow piping. So if you can see that, um, just where it comes to the point is probably the point where you can see it best. But just here, see there's a very tiny, narrow layer of piping there. The flounces were created a little differently by simply gathering the fabric and then attaching it to the base skirt with tiny running stitches. The top edge of the bottom flounce is then edged with narrow piping too, because I'm assuming this was visible. Whereas the top flounce, you can't see, it's hidden by the, the flounce at the top here, by the peplum. But this one was visible, and so it's edged with tiny, narrow piping. The top of this, the top fleet, um, fleet here, uh, the flounce here, or peplum, looks like it might be an extension of the bodice, but in fact it is a separate piece of fabric which is pleated in, and these are flat pleats this time, pleated into the waistband at the seam. So it's attached quite differently, but it is in fact a separate piece of fabric. The skirt itself is slightly shorter at the front than the back. In fact, there's 10 centimetres difference in the length of the skirt. And that probably, we assume, helped a woman to walk without treading on her skirts. But it means that the way the flounces are attached is carefully graduated. So if you look at the slide, you can see that they're attached um, in a sloping fashion away from the waistline and towards the back of the skirt. As I said, the construction is quite complex. The bodice of the dress was made to fit quite snugly to the upper body. Here's a view from the back, and this is the view from the front. The fan-shaped pleating, which is used as a decorative feature on the bodice, here, here, is made by cutting two white sections of fabric and then pleating them onto the shoulder seams so that they fell over the bust and were then gathered together in a deep band of ruching here, just above the waist. And you can see it here, it's quite a deep band. The waist itself comes down to a point and the waistline at this time was set just below the natural waistline. So the natural waistline in this dress is somewhere around about here. But by the time it gets down to the front, you see, it's sloped down by 
probably a good inch or more and comes to a point just here. When we see a couple of slides a little bit later on, you'll see that in the illustrations that pointed effect was often quite exaggerated, but I suspect probably more exaggerated in illustrations than in fact, but hard to know that. The wide flounced sleeves, oh, there's the ruching in more detail for those of you at home. The wide flounced sleeves were a particular feature of the early to mid 1850s, and they were known for reasons that are a little bit obscure as pagoda sleeves. We presume the word came from the Japanese, but why pagoda sleeves? I'm not sure. They were made tight at the top of the arm, and the armholes in this dress are very narrow, much more narrow than you would imagine. And then they open out in two layers of deep flounces. Almost certainly a woman would have worn undersleeves of a light muslin, probably white muslin or cambric underneath, and they would have been tied on just below the elbow. So although the sleeves look open and loose, they're actually set over quite close-fitting lining. And the cut of the sleeves probably made it quite difficult to raise the arm much above the shoulder. The sleeves are set into the shoulder, back from the natural shoulder line, as you can see. So they're quite, quite set quite back here. On the dress itself, they're set back here. The natural shoulder line is here. And the effect of that was to create a sloping effect to the shoulders and the arm, which was the fashionable look. But the other effect probably was that it was quite difficult to raise your arms up wearing a dress like this. So as you can see, the construction of the dress is quite detailed and quite complex. There's a lot of fine sewing involved. If we look at the stitching, we can see that even on the skirt seams, the little stitches are close together and tiny. They're between one and a half and two millimetres in length, or even less sometimes. And the flounces themselves are all edged with very tiny, probably sixteenth of an inch wide, that's about one and 1.5 millimetres um, hems, and, and finished with tiny hemming stitches. Now it was said at the time that a skilled dressmaker could make a crinoline dress in about 14 hours but I'm sure that depended on the complexity of the construction. I can't imagine sewing it all by hand, let alone in 14 hours. Um, and I'm sure it depended too on the skill of the dressmaker. Now sadly we don't know either who owned or who made this dress. There's no dressmaker's label, so it could have been made by a woman at home. We do know that at this time almost every woman learned to sew of necessity. So not everybody enjoyed it, and not everybody was good at it, but all little girls were taught to do it, whether they liked it or not. And we know that even elite women were often quite capable of repairing their clothing or remaking dresses to, to update them. Many ordinary women probably spent hour upon hour upon hour in sewing, both their own and their children's clothing. Because if you think about it, Clothing couldn't always be bought made up at this time. Sometimes it could, but sometimes not. And if you had to sew by hand every stitch of clothing that you or your children wore, that was an immense amount of sewing to be doing. What we can know with certainty is that this dress would have involved many, many hours of sewing, some of it quite intricate, and that getting the shape right in both the bodice and the skirts was highly skilled work. It probably meant that a woman needed to pin or, or in other words, tack these things on, stand back and look at them, and then make adjustments um, in some way. So what did it mean to wear a dress like this at the time? The first thing to understand is that dresses like this depended for proper shaping on wearing the right underwear underneath. Before the crinoline frame was invented, these very full skirts were held out by petticoats, lots of petticoats. By the mid-1850s, it was common for women to wear as many as four, five, or even six petticoats under their crinolines to help hold them out. And at least one of those petticoats was often stiffened with horsehair or with a sort of cotton rope that later came back into fashion in the 1950s. And may have made a, a recent reappearance, I think, too. Women at this time wore a lot of underwear, probably more than at any other time in the past. 
And it's worth remembering that when looking at the dimensions of this dress. The base layer of a woman's clothing at this time was a chemise or a shift. From about this time, women also began to wear pantaloons, mostly at this time called drawers. They were made of a light cotton or linen. They had fairly wide legs, as you can see here, and they fastened at the waist. The inner legs were open and remained so until the following century, most, mostly. Now, those garments were new for women. Until this time, little girls wore pantaloons, but women did not. They were seen as being unhygienic. But these wider skirts, of course, um, had some hazards attached to them, and the crinoline frame in particular was rather buoyant, and ladies very quickly um, adopted pantaloons under those. They also wore on the legs knitted stockings of linen, wool, or, sick, uh, or silk, which covered the lower legs and were held up at this time by garters. Over the chemise and the drawers was worn the all-important corset, and here's an illustration from the time. This was the garment that created the shape of the upper part of the body. In this period, it had a wide wooden busk, it could be way by two, that went right down the front and was over an inch in width, right down to this point here. And that held the upper body rigid. It was then, um, then stiffened by other bones which went right down and, and at the back and the sides. It fastened at the front with very strong hooks and eyes, three or four, and then laced at the back. And you can see the lacing on this corset here. So here's the front view and here's the back view, as you can see. The corset encased the body from just under the bust to right down to the mid-thigh. There's a lot of speculation about so-called tight lacing at this time and later in the century, and it's very difficult to know how much actually went on. The natural waistline of this particular dress measures about 25 inches, or 63 centimetres, which may actually seem rather more than you were expecting. There was a lot of talk at this time about an ideal waist being 18 inches. But in fact, if, um, if you look at the, the work that's been written about costumes in museum collections, you'll read that almost no dresses have been found with such a tiny waist as this, not dresses worn by women anyway. 25 inches is not much considering how many layers there were underneath, I think. Petticoats to support the skirt, as I said, were added in ever-increasing numbers in the 1850s. This illustration is interesting, I think, because it suggests that most of the petticoats were actually worn under the, this, the basques of the corset here. This is this bit that comes out from the waist. And that makes sense if you think of the, of the volume of material that had to be accommodated at the waist. But then finally, of course, the dress went on over the top of all of this, but that wasn't the end of it either. If a woman went out, she probably wore a jacket or a little pelisse, as you can see in this illustration here, a bonnet and gloves. Uh, even in warm weather, she would have worn gloves. And in the summer, she might carry a parasol, as you can see here. By this time, it's been estimated that she was probably carrying about at least eight kilos in clothing, and maybe more than that. So you see why, when the steel hooped uh, crinoline frame came in in 1856, it must have seemed like a godsend to women. It was adopted almost immediately. All of a sudden, this dress looks a little bit less romantic, doesn't it? It's pretty, but it must have been an enormous load to carry around. And pretty tricky to manage, too, especially in the muddy or dusty conditions of the Victorian goldfields. But we know from many sources at the time that it was the ideal to aspire to and that women of all conditions of life wore it. Here's one illustration by artist George, George Lacey poking fun at the pretensions of a lucky digger's wife in Ballarat in 1852. And he called his sketch Digger's Wife in Full Dress. And if you can see, and you can see it clearly enough to see, and for those at home, if you can see the expressions on the faces of the people looking on, you'll see that they're quietly laughing. 
at the lady in all her rather mismatched, perhaps, finery. This sketch probably also illustrates the fact that managing a dress look this, like this took both training and expertise. Young women were taught how to walk. They were taught how to walk like ladies, how to manage their skirts, how to lift their skirts to avoid the puddles and the mud, how to lift their skirts to go upstairs discreetly, how to sit. Most chairs for ladies didn't have arms at this time, and we can see why. But there's no doubt that wearing a skirt like this would have hampered women's movements at this time in every minute of every day. One of the American feminists, I think it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who had six children, I think, once said that even going up and down stairs in the clothing of the day was a challenge and could be downright dangerous, especially with a baby. And she said, as she pointed out, it needed one hand to hold the baby, one hand to hold up the skirts. How was she then going to hold the candle to see where she was going? Such a simple point, isn't it? Such a simple everyday task made so difficult. What it probably meant was lots of going backwards and forwards. Up the stairs to carry the candle up, down the stairs again to get the baby, up the stairs with the baby, providing you can still see where you're going. Low tide a woman who was caught up in a shipwreck because there was no hope of surviving in the water in a dress like this. It also meant schooling girls from the time they were little, and this is a Victorian family, as in Victoria, Australia family, in the 1850s. And they were taught to temper the way they behaved and what they did to the clothing they wore. So little girls were pretty much bound for the more boisterous play of their brothers by the time they were wearing clothing like this. The clothing made it almost impossible to do the sorts of things that we would hope most of our little girls are able to do today. The crinoline looked very impressive, but it must have been a really difficult fashion to wear on the goldfinch. Can you imagine trying to move around a tent in a dress like this one? Even ordinary houses were quite small at this time and they were very full of furniture. Just manoeuvring around them in a dress like this must have been a real challenge. Cartoonists at this time often made fun of domestic servants wearing crinolines and the chaos that they could create. And if you can see this one, it's not a very good um, illustration now but you can see that the maid's been moving through, moving through the room and the dustpan behind her is total chaos as her skirts are banged into things and, and knock them off the furniture. But they could also be dangerous and here is the more serious side of this. These skirts were so wide that they could be caught up in moving carriage wheels or even more seriously, brushed too close to open fires. And there were many, many stories in local newspapers warning women about how dangerous it could be to brush too close to a fire. Little girls too could be injured in this way and it's really horrible to read those stories and then to think about um, what happened afterwards. But finally, I think it's worth a little bit of thought about how a dress like this was going to be cared for. One thing to make it, one thing to wear it. How do you then look after it? It's a summer dress, so we might assume that it was washed. But not all fabrics at this time washed at all or well. They shrank in hot water or the colours ran in the wash. Women in Australia were always writing home asking family to send them what they called washing cottons, but it didn't always work. Once you've invested all the time and money in making a dress like this, I wonder if you'd even have been prepared to risk it in the wash sure that I would have. My bet is that you wouldn't wash it all that often. And can you imagine the ironing, what she had? In fact, we know that clothing was washed far less frequently in the past. Underwear was changed more often. But outer clothing was often brushed and what they called aired before being worn again and again. Standards of cleanliness were different as presumably it was awareness of body odour. There must have been a lot of that about. But then there were lots of other smells about too, so perhaps people were just a bit desensitised. Perhaps they noticed it less. Now that's just a very brief introduction that I've been able to give today 
So the things a dress like this might have to tell us about what it was like living in Victoria in the 1850s if you were a woman. I think it's very hard for us to imagine what it was like to wear a dress like this one, partly because we haven't been up to, brought up to wear clothing like this, so we, we haven't been habituated to it since childhood, which these women were. It seems completely alien to us in this era of pants for women and lovely, stretchy, comfortable fabric, that, that women could have been so restricted in clothing of this sort. But there's no doubt that wearing clothing like this dictated a very different way of moving around and very different things that women were able to do. It restricted what you could do easily and it must have used a lot of energy simply to move the clothing around. Above all, what it did was impose an image of women, I think, which was far less active, more passive than men, maybe as more decorative, ornaments to society rather than active participants in it. Although we know that many women at this time, working women, were actually were very active. It's worth remembering that when we think about women's lives in 1850s Melbourne, and perhaps more particularly on the hot and dusty gold fields in the summer. So thanks very much for listening today. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to try and answer them. Katie, do we have any questions? Um, just a question, um, what did men wear at this time? Ah, um, what, what men wore um, was completely different, of course. Um, men wore trousers, of course, and they wore shirts, which were made uh, quite, they were quite voluminous. So, and they often had detachable collars so that the collars could be washed. Now, that's another interesting comment on the times because it was pretty much expected that you would wash the collars maybe daily, maybe every other day, but you wash the shirt once a week. So then again, you know, you change collar, but you'd leave your shirt, and sometimes the cuffs too. And it's not so long ago, actually, that most women knew how to what they called turn a collar or turn a cuff. And that meant, meant that they would literally turn them around or turn them inside out and then reattach them to the shirt. Because the collar, the collar of course, uh, wore uh, more than any other part of the shirt. Uh, men then wore uh, a coat on the top, and many of the coats were made out of quite heavy material. So some of the men on the goldfields wore what they called gabardine, which was probably cotton, uh, fairly, fairly thick cotton, but many other suiting materials at this time were actually wool. So they must have been really uncomfortable to wear. And if you look at any photographs, even um, later in the century, of working men, you'll see that most working men wore suits even for work that was incredibly heavy. So even, even the, the men on the waterfront um, who were loading and unloading still had their suits and their hats on. So that must have been uh, taken quite some time. Men didn't necessarily wear underwear at this time. That's another interesting thought under their trousers. So you might like to think about that too. Are there any other questions that anybody has? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming along. For those who are here, thank you for listening in for those at home and I hope you found it interesting.